just welcome all of you. Welcome back uh, for those of you that were there last week. Welcome to those of you that are joining us for the first time. This is as my colleagues and I thinking, you know, this uh, coronavirus um, crisis is having an impact on people in so many different ways. And what is it that we can do uh, maybe in a series of uh, webinars? Uh, we're thinking three this month. This is the second of them. Next one is going to be on uh, uh, keeping and gaining customers, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Last week, we just introduced the overall concept of 100 days, 1,000 days, and this week uh, is on extending the runway, which is probably why we have more sign-ups this week than we did uh, last week. So I guess it's a, a more topical uh, interest. So in essence, the idea behind the 100 days, 1,000 days is saying, look, we need to get through this period together, and then when we've got through it, then what? What's the long game, right? Because we need to have a vision. Otherwise, surviving 100 days is fine. What happens on day 101? Where do we go from there? So this is about trying to play both, both cards at the same time. And so here we are. And we decided on this week to have a little panel discussion. We'll ask each of the panel members to say a few words on, on their take. In terms of extending the runway, maybe some practical things they've seen and heard from as an investor, Simon Thorpe, Cambridge Angels, Andrew Lynn, from the point of view of being a CEO and doing things that he's doing in practical ways, and Frank uh, Zilstra, having been the CEO in the travel industry, which has probably taken as big a beating as any other industry uh, at the moment. So for each of the panel members to say a few words on these practicalities of um, surviving these 100 days, we had some thematic areas we were going to offer on maybe renegotiating contracts, new or existing contracts. Has that come up in your conversations? Will that be different? Maybe managing outstanding debts that might be there in the companies. How do we do that? Debtors and creditors, both sides actually of the fence, because uh, we don't want to be over trading or getting ourselves into also the difficulty. Like the uh, bank uh, lending scheme technically puts you into a, a false situation of being an over trading, admitting you're an over trading if you have to borrow that money to survive, so how does that impact on the balance sheet and in fact your legal fiduciary duties? What tricks have you found being used by companies that are reducing overheads, maximizing profitability in this, in this environment? What uh, flipping uh, has happened? And managing stakeholders, how do you manage their expectations right now? I did a bit of a blog the other day talking about investors running for the hills uh, and maybe not standing up are stepping up to the plate. It's had a bit of a reaction, mostly positive, uh, but I know that investors are helping their companies with second rounds, those they've invested in, to keep them going, to keep them afloat, uh, to provide mentoring and uh, uh, all sorts of other ways of uh, assistance. So I don't want to undermine any of that. So, uh, but here we are, and we need to look forward as well. So let me just invite each of my panel members to say a few quick words and then we open up to a Q&A. Those of you that would like to, there's the chat, uh, group chat system. You can pop your questions in there as we go along. And between Len and myself, we will try to get as many of your questions in. And then once we've done the basic intros, then we'll open it up to a, a general discussion. I don't expect Chaba to be typing any questions up on his screen. <laughs> he seems to be going to a meeting, so we'll leave him out of it. But Frank, would you like to start us off with a concept since um, you were here last week as well? Sure. Thank you very much, Shai, for, um, for giving me the opportunity to share uh, what, what I've seen and heard. And talking to a lot of my former colleagues at Booking, Expedia, and other travel companies, um, it, it, the, the, the statement comes up very clearly, like this is a long-term game and it's a cash flow game. Um, it's, it's a game you want to get out of at some point and you want to do this with um, the right people, the right companies around you uh, to be ready for when the revenue is going to flow again. So um, even if there's a, an amazing opportunity to renegotiate contracts, um, what, what I'm seeing is that there needs to be a, a clear mind of what to negotiate with and, um, um, and what to negotiate for. 
there's a great opportunity to reduce prices, for instance. Um, I'm not sure if long term with your partners, that's, that's the best decision going forward. Uh, if it's one of these long term partners you have in mind, where in the thousand days you want to do this excellent business with, um, maybe then it's a good thing to understand what their need is going forward and how you can actually create a bond during this period, which is going to be a lasting experience that long term can really help you excel in the things that you're going to do long term. Um, so it's not only the 100 day survival in my mind, but it's also keeping a clear mind of what's the long term objective and who do you want to do these things with. Great. Thank you. Uh, Frank, Andrew, do you want to pick up on this theme? Are you? I think those are very, very wise words from Frank. Um, mm. You know, I think, uh, you know, booking.com, Expedia, that, that's a hell of a lot of good experience there. And I'd love to swap more stories at some point, Frank. But I think that that theme of, of what's the long term play and who do you want to be, who do you want to be partnering with extends beyond just your suppliers and your customers all the way to to your investors quite frankly to, to touch on the final theme and i know simon will have some thoughts on this but um you know from my days trying to manage orthomimetics which was you know it was a fairly small company um back in 2008 and 9 you know what was uh, was look, what looked like a phenomenal investor base in the goldman sachs partnership a hedge fund within the schroders uh, and then a couple of private equity firms that sounded great in 2006, and it sounded distinctly less great in uh, November 2008 when uh, they went back and, and started investing in public markets. Um, that's not to say they weren't phenomenal partners in, in finding an exit, which was the, uh, the end game for orthomedics in that case, and actually a pretty satisfactory one, all things considered. Um, but that really shaped the, the profile of our current investor base. Um, in the really having high quality VC investors who, who get what it's like to go through a crisis like this and, and support companies through that. Uh, yeah. You know, so I, I think the, the thousand days absolutely stretches forward a thousand days, um, but uh, actually it also stretches back a thousand days and, and the maturity and the experience to be able to have, have, have said, look, um, when markets are frothy and money is cheap, um, who are we taking cash from? Who are we partnering with going forward? I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Built to Last. Um, and I think this concept of, of what's the big, hairy, audacious goal for your business? What are you working towards? What, what's the combination of, of luck, strategy, and execution that you need to get you through, again, 100 days, 1,000 days, and forward? And then who, who's along with you for the journey? Because um, that'll dictate how, what sort of dialogue you have with your investors, just as it dictates how you have dialogue and what terms you push for, as Frank has touched on uh, with, with your suppliers and your other partners as well. So, Andrew, Andrew, have you started to have those dialogues with uh, anyone uh, without naming names? I mean, what's the state of play? We're, with, we're with three and a half weeks into that dialogue, actually. I think this, yeah. um, I, so here, uh, Here's my insight from 2008, nine. I would, I would make a broad, uh, maybe it's just who I choose to hang around with these days, Shai, I don't quite know, but I make a broad observation. There's a lot less of the, ah, this is nothing, this will pass. Don't worry about it, everything will be fine. There's a fair bit more realism. And I actually think the fact that we have 40 people signed up to this, this particular call is an indication of the fact yeah. no, no, one, no one's suffering from ostrich syndrome here, which is no. a really good thing. Um, and, and I think, um, so I, I remember very distinctly the meeting we had with, it happened to be the golden guys, when um, maybe there was a, a, a bit of dialogue around our board table saying, I don't worry, they, they can't afford to abandon you now. There's a wonderful world within golden parlance, which is understood. And that, that has a particular meaning. It means uh, up until now, I didn't have enough information to act. If you keep talking, you're going to annoy me. Uh, but a guy called Howard Rowe, I've got a lot of time for uh, when I went in saying, you know, some people are telling me that, that we shouldn't worry and you guys are going to, you guys will just come in. It's a small amount of money for you. I'll just come in and, and put money in. He said, understood. And then he went on to say, 
Um, so th this is where, where my favorite equation comes from, is that uh, success is not the sum of luck, strategy, and execution. It's the product of those three things. <laughs> and while it's absolutely true that any one of those can contribute disproportionately, it's also true that if any one of those is zero, you're screwed. Um, and he did a very good job of saying, understood, here's how the outside world has changed. Um, here's what you can do about it. You can either choose to assume that I'm, I'm wrong um, and, and I'm not, and that we're going to come in and save you at the last second. And with all due respect, that's probably not going to happen. Nothing to do with you, but we don't do this anymore. Um, you can choose to take a horribly dilutive financing round, um, or you've got some good exit options here and we can help you help you act on that. So um, we'd actually done a, a decent job of discussing amongst ourselves as founders what we wanted from, from this, from that venture. I think we had a pretty good dialogue with our investors at that point, knowing what they wanted and it was, it was financial return. And actually it's pretty obvious which one of those three options we, we went for. And again, that came from having good, open, honest dialogue, knowing, well, it should have been, well, in all cases, ahead of time, but knowing as far in advance what the expectations of those partners are, what they want from it. Mm -hmm. Because if you have to start from scratch um, and, and, and in, in understanding those when you're in a crisis, you're, you're already playing catch up. So it's yeah. a long-winded way of getting around to the answer to your question. I think this time... Uh, we've started those difficult dialogues really, really early. Um, and, you know, hopefully, again, time will tell, but hopefully, uh, if anything, we're, we hope we're, we're on the side of overreacting, in which case we can pull out hopefully earlier. But uh, we've had those dialogues for at least three and a half. Now. Yeah. So, Simon, let me uh, turn to you. Just before that, uh, if it's safe, uh, Chaba, if you can hear me, would you be able to turn off your camera? Because it's distracting a few people. But... Please don't hit sure, anything sure, sure. while you're turning no, on no, the camera. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jabba. Simon, uh, thank you. your, your, your insights, right. please. Maybe watching, uh, watching uh, the driving going on. Um, <laughs> but so, uh, so some of you already know, I'm chairman of Cambridge Angels. Uh, just a quick bit of background. We are roughly 55 to 60 angels, largely based in Cambridge, but in the southeast of England, one or two in America. We invest in largely tech companies, life sciences companies. We have a portfolio of 100 companies uh, from pure startup to large scale ups like uh, Feature Space and Privatar, for example. So a wide range of companies. We have hosted, and what's probably most relevant for this call, we, we went virtual a few weeks ago like everybody else and we decided how are we going to actually interact? How are we going to be able to deal with pitches to us? So we've moved the whole thing online, largely on Zoom calls. And uh, we've actually found that we're probably more interactive now than we've ever been as a group of members because we host calls like this. We've got one at five o'clock this evening where we're actually discussing some of the sim similar themes to this. But we basically pick themes that we think are relevant to our entrepreneurs and we then discuss them with the entrepreneurs and uh, try to swap ideas. So that's been pretty helpful. Uh, like uh, some of you on the call, but not everybody, uh, I've been around a bit. Uh, I've been through the 87 crash, the 99, 2000 boom and bust, and the 2008 great financial crisis. As with all crises, uh, they are all black swan events. You never know they're coming. And so, of course, everyone is different. This one, again, is very different. And the way I've been thinking about it is in three parts. There's a healthcare impact, there's an economic impact, and there's a financial impact. And those three things are, are one, one flows from another but they're all very important um, aspects to be thinking about. One thing to think about uh, is that this crisis has actually accelerated the pace of change in certain sectors massively. So for example, e-commerce was already growing quite quickly, but it's growing even faster now than it, than it ever was, and the high street will be getting destroyed even faster than it was before. Secondly, healthcare, the digitization of healthcare has exploded. You know, some of the clinicians I know have said to me that the amount of innovation that's happened in the UK has, in the last two or three weeks, has uh, outpaced that over the last 10 years. And the same thing's happened in remote education. So there's big change to be thinking about. And of course, we're all trying to think about these things in a way in, in just a few weeks. We're thinking about how we impact over 100 days. But that means we need to be thinking about, well, how do we survive over the 100 days? How, how do we protect our runways? How do we actually change our strategy to deal with the next thousand days? So anyway, that's that's enough from me for now. 
Um, back, back to you, Shai. That's great. Thank you. Are, are there some uh, practical uh, case examples you can give us from some of your companies without obviously naming any of them in terms of what they might have been doing uh, to extend yeah, so, the runway? So, uh, so, so like you, Shai, I've had the experience of a VC pulling out of mm -hmm. uh, funding a deal within literally days of COVID first really breaking. Yeah. And so in that situation, we had to essentially revisit all the existing investors with a new plan. Um, so as a board, I mean, the good thing about it was it actually brought the board together in a way that we hadn't been uh, before um, because everybody had to rally around and we had to work out the plan and then we had to, we had to work out a very credible plan. And essentially yeah. what we did was we raised a smaller sum of money from existing investors, having cut everybody's salaries by 50%. And having worked out 50. A way, 50, five, zero. Um, okay. And having worked out a way that we could get to break even. Um, and, and we've done that. And we've also, we, we looked at the furloughing scheme, but the furloughing scheme wouldn't work for that company because we needed every single employee to, to be retained working. Um, it was a software company and uh, we're pivoting to away from travel, which was one of the major sectors, which is obviously why we were let down um, into other sectors. Um, and so uh, we, you know, we pulled the deal off. So that's one example. Um, I saw I saw Andrew nodding at the uh, salary cuts. Have you had to go through that as well, Andrew? You're on mute. There we go. Off mute there. So um, yeah, we we considered that with orthomedics very very hard. I think the, the again the the dialogue there is one of the most difficult ones to go through. Um, but that, that's, that's where all of the trust you've built up, all the, the communication skills as a, as a chief exec or CFO or whatever it is come into play. Because if you've got a horrible relationship and no trust built up, that's, that's a, a difficult one to do. And hold on to those people that Simon, as Simon mentioned, you need to come into the office and give, give their all. So yeah, that, that's a tough one, but it's, it's kind of your job to have that, that thought and to do those scenario yeah. Analyses right up front. And and is this an indefinite thing, Simon, or is it like a for three next three months or next two months or whatever? Yeah, what it's a great question. It's it's very much a temporary three month thing. And it was yeah. very much the team, the whole team agreeing that that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I think that's quite an extreme example. I've just given you that as an example. Uh, what I'm seeing in one or two other situations is a twenty twenty to thirty percent cut. Yeah. Uh, on, on the basis that nobody's got any travel expenses, you know, people aren't able to really spend the money that they normally would spend, again, on a temporary basis. So, for example, something else I've seen is that quite a few of my companies in material science or, or life sciences don't have access to the university labs that they would normally have access to. And uh, so they've either had to change their plan to do other work short term, or they've had to find a means of getting the kit out of the lab to somewhere else where they can uh, actually operate the kit or use yeah. another lab that's non-university. Um, but I've, I've got a couple of examples of companies who've managed to take the initiative and, and, and do that. Oh, that's excellent that they've actually got, been able to do that. So I see some other uh, entrepreneurs, one or two faces I recognize, uh, Sabesin and, and Paul uh, Anson. Do you guys want to just tell us what, uh, what you've been doing in your companies? And... Sure. So. Um... Hi there, my name is Samesan, the CEO of Pervay Society in the Cambridge uh, University startup. Um, so we've done a number of measures, one including pay cut uh, to everyone, let a uh, number of employees on furlough scheme uh, for the next three months, um, and then retain the, the core team uh, where we cut uh, salary for everyone. Um, and then we also done a number of measures in terms of as coming down on um, office space, reducing marketing overheads and operating uh, expenses. Um, and in addition to that, then we also had uh, people like Stanley Black and Decker as one of the investors alongside other key investors, uh, just putting money to back up the plan such that we can see us through for the next 24 months, uh, during which we also uh, make it profitable as a business. So that's the whole plan we put forward to these existing investors. And they all got the way approved and just closing the deal uh, as of next week, all done and dusted. Well, congratulations for doing that in this climate. Thank you. And what happened to the valuation conversation in those uh, discussions? So that, that's, that's the most challenging one. <laughs> <laughs> 
in this because the rest is also airport to be honest because we had a revenue we continue to have revenue from stanley black and deckers and various other customers yeah because the defense aerospace obviously not really affected um but the challenge is the valuation so luckily 50 percent of the investment we managed to do as a convert upon the yeah. logic and okay because 50 was round um is that uh, they invested in the last um valuation last round valuation very good you've taken some excellent quick measures really pleased to hear that some good examples there of uh the point that andrew and frank were making is who do you want to do business with and if uh, you've got a key customer there that's willing to back you through this uh, hard times it's fantastic actually that you've been able to build up that uh, relationship and uh Paul, turning to you for a moment. What's your? Um, well, how long have you got? There's about five companies I've been engaged with through this. I think the yeah. common, and they're all affected in different ways. The common theme has been uh, protect cash, without question. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but just protecting cash is is not a you know it's just as a single strategy isn't going to work for long. So protect cash because that keeps you alive. But then <clears throat> focus on. You know what? What adjustments do you need to make with your market to to win sales? And and that's the key is to is to sort of balance the cost and sales thing. You've got to try and get those sales, whatever's going on. Um, so I can talk about various businesses. One, you know, one business makes um, uh, N95 standard masks. So they've been they they've they've had to like maximise their uh, increase their production by about a thousandfold. So there, it's all been about work in progress, uh, cash for that, making sure that, that works out. Um, another company, the other extreme, was installing systems in homes for fire protection. They cannot make any installations. They cannot deliver anything. They cannot bring in any cash. So yeah. they've had to furlough nearly everybody, but really look after those customers to make sure that when things change, that that business is still secure. Um, one of the CEOs of another company I invested in is actually on the call. Um, that was a slightly different situation. Um, it was a product selling to the hotel space. Customers, of course, have just, you know, shut up shop. Um, but there's some existing trials in progress. There was an existing funding in progress. They've, they're accelerating uh, into another secondary market where it's an R&D focus. There's income coming from R&D. And if the first market takes a long time to wake up, the hotel space, this other space, they're looking at which is sort of agri-tech area, may take over. But the key was to get the funding round brought forward, get that done. They adjusted their valuation a little bit just to demonstrate to investors that they recognize the risks have increased. That was very well received and the investors are back to the company as they were anyway and, and are supporting them. So it's, in that case, it was some small adjustments to focus and, and sort of be really realistic about yeah. um, another company again is sort of very much stalled but was looking at finding its feet in the market they furloughed a lot of workers they're working with a corporate f funder um, but they're using the time to kind of tidy up a few bits of R&D uh, they've secured or they're working on securing a 50k grant and they're stopping their cash burn whilst I'm focusing on, on a new go-to-market strategy with a commercial partner. So it's a sort of partly uh, stagnated situation, but making sure they can spring into action coming out the other side of it. So yeah. it's also going on, but it's definitely, everyone's looking very seriously at the situation and going, we have to change something. We can't just sit this out, we change something. No, we have to change something. I think it's very wise because that's the tone I'm picking up from all the various conversations have uh, I've got uh, uh, Arun's on the call you've been helping a lot of companies as well Arun I think haven't you uh, through this period that's right Shai and uh, quite often the experiences are shared between um, what has been described today yeah. and um, ultimately companies are focused on coming through the other side and uh, one of the points that Simon made, made earlier about access to lab facilities Mm -hmm. That's affecting a lot of innovative companies because unless they have access to labs, they're looking at um, a complete stop to their technology development for six months or so. A um, couple of companies yeah. I know working in the Cambridge region, they have access to some of Allen Brooks and other labs, but even they, they cannot be guaranteed because they can always be repurposed 
for healthcare. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the key is to actually come out the other side in whatever way, shape or form and have stronger shape. an entity, exactly, yeah, an entity that is there. Yeah. Okay, and tell us how's things going in Denmark on this front? Able to um, give us well, a commentary I, I, about I, I, I can there? I can share a little bit of an interesting story which hasn't come to an end yet. So, yes. and um, for a couple of years, I've been working with a small uh, manufacturing company, metal manufacturing company, uh, roughly six million pounds turnover, a good thirty employees, uh, 20, 20 people in production, and about ten in administration. Just before the the whole COVID thing uh, set in, early February. Uh, perhaps late January, uh, a major potential customer turned down the proposition for, for, uh, for this uh, uh, little metal working business that they were not going to join as a customer. And uh, the company has recently been taken over by a um, significant, significantly larger uh, ger uh, German company in the same industry. Uh, so good, good backing financially, etc. cetera. Um, but this customer saying no thank you resulted in a bit of a, a crisis situation because that basically means from a financial point of view the company is heading directly for bankruptcy uh, so we oh. said okay what, what do we do we need some some crisis management here so we spent three weeks uh, preparing different strategic scenarios uh, cutting down admin uh, taking part of the production to uh, to, to germany uh, cutting down some of the lines in production etc we on the board agreed on a few different uh, initiatives uh, that was uh, uh, wrapped up in a, in a nice little emergency plan that was executed. Mm -hmm. So a third of the company was uh, given notice and that was all before uh, this uh, co Corona thing happened. Uh, and Denmark closed their borders and locked everything down by the 11th of March. And this was all done in February. And as everything was being implemented, uh, and we could see, okay, we, we have the outlook to the deficit uh, mm -hmm. the company was looking at right now. Um, things has stabilized on a, on a critical level. And just today, I was told that one of the production workers has been infected with the coronavirus. Oh. And there's about 20 people in the production. Uh, it is a, a fairly widespread production with the... Uh, a decent distance between the different production workers, but they still interact. And obviously they see each other at lunch break. So right now we don't know what's gonna happen because everything has been cut to the bone with staffing uh, in production and staffing amongst the uh, admin people. So we're really vulnerable with, you know, even one person being off ill, but now obviously somebody has just announced they, they got the coronavirus, now what? Uh, do we need to basically lock down or close down the whole production because everybody needs to go into a two weeks quarantine? A uh, quarantine. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's the open-ended story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning. Uh, so uh, that that's think, that's that's where the business is. I think you're waving a big flag here about uh, the need for resilience being built into the businesses. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, let's uh, for Frank. Let me hand back back to you and then maybe Simon a little bit after that. Frank, your, your thoughts on, the, on, on this topic of resilience, which is the one that's come up, it's just, uh, it feels yeah. a little bit like the National Health Service for 10 years faced austerities and now they can see the effect that that's having on, uh, in the UK at least, on what's going on. Yeah, um, the, the impact is massive. <clears throat> and, and some costs will even um, disappear by itself, the whole traveling that we're doing is uh, just basically skipped to zero. Um, what's, your, what's your take on the thousand days and beyond for the, for the travel, business travel sector or the leisure travel sector? How, do you think it will, are they thinking about how to get back? Because we're talking about, well, let's look, let's look long term. And let's just take your, your uh, uh, experience in the, in the industry in which you have uh, some insights, deep insights. What's it yeah, look like it, it very different. It very much differs for like the size of the companies. Like if you look at companies like uh, Booking and Expedia, it's yeah. 
it, it's quite hard to uh, to start changing direction fast mm -hmm. now within the, mm -hmm. these hundred days. And, and even if you would test a, a new scenario, a new direction, uh, it's going to be very hard to um, um, to get the, these revenues up to the level that they have been used to. Um, so they're they're sort of set in in a certain path. Um, and, uh, and, and which they need to start, keep following uh, and making sure they stay there for the long term. And there's still a lot of cleanup within these companies mm. uh, from a technology point of view, um, uh, but also from a platform point of view where they, can, uh, where they can be a lot more clear about what they would like to do in the future. So I think their thousand day discussion is going to be key in everything they do. And, and keep based on this, keep on making the right decisions. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they will get support just due to the size they have from investors, uh, from partners, from um, uh, governments to really make sure that long term they will stay. It's more the smaller ones with the newer technologies, um, which, which, um, which have a very challenging time. And I really like the approach I'm hearing here, where you say, it's like, hey, you know what? It's the technology, a platform we've built. What else is it ready for? And um, what, what other opportunities are there? And what an amazing time this is pushing us to. And, and you know, I don't think anybody thinks this time is easy. Um, <clears throat> and and yeah. it shouldn't be easy. It should be hard. It should be challenging. And it should drive us nuts continuously. Uh, it should worry us, um, but it should also bond us to bring ideas together where initially we didn't think of. Uh, and keep on sharing and talking every day, every hour helps me to, to come up with these new, new ideas, new directions, um, think of technologies that have been used somewhere else and see mm -hmm. like how we can apply it in, in technologies elsewhere. And um, it, the, 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 on the one hand, you've got Amazon, who's, who just seems to be smashing it. And on the other hand, you've got so many companies like Expedia that have such an extremely hard time. So where is the decision making being done in the past, where that ultimate focus that Expedia has created, for instance, how could have that, that have been different somewhere along the way? And how can you learn now from setting the right direction for your thousand days yeah. going back to your partners discussing like, Hey, you know what? We've, we've checked, we've, we've made mistakes in the past. This is our new direction. That's what we're going to stick to. That's <coughs> going to be really interesting. Andrew, do you want to come in on that? And then yeah. Simon, I'd like to draw you in on the, uh, and then, and then, and then I would like to open it up to questions. So Andrew, if you'd like to come in and Simon, uh, not many, People have taken up the bank uh, lo loan schemes and things like that. But first, Andrew, perhaps you can comment and then I'll come back to you to see what are our companies doing about so-called so help from governments? But Andrew... Uh, so, so I'll take a, a COVID-19 specific interpretation of, of mm -hmm. the 1,000 days versus 100 days. And it's, it's, yeah. it's actually kind of paradoxical. So I, I agree completely. A lot of life science companies have discovered they've got applications related to COVID-19 or, or related applications that they've discovered because of the push and the urgency um, are around COVID-19 specific applications. But I think um, that that's in a way, maybe it's not the 100 days, but maybe it's the, the, the 200 days. <laughs> um, that, that, that's important. That's great. But in yeah. life science terms anyway, you've got to really think. So let's, let's take the example of uh, not to get too technical about it, but the frontline PCR-based detection techniques. Do you have COVID-19 right now? Um, sure, there are, it's, it's tempting to go after applications like that. It's tempting, I guess, maybe even more tempting to go after applications that would be the next wave, the antibody tests that, that, that tell people, well, have you had it? And therefore, can you go back to work? Um, but from, from our perspective, I think uh, we're hearing a lot from life science investors that, yeah, look, absolutely, if you're investing in public markets and you've got someone who's, who's got the scale and who's ready to execute on something COVID-19 related, yeah, pile pa your, pa your money into those guys for sure. But if you've got a follower that doesn't have scale, um, actually, 
they're probably going to be too late to the party to be perfectly candid about it. So really thinking in the context of the thousand days is the focus that we're developing as a result of COVID-19 are those new applications that we're finding for us at Pluidic, for example, um, a, a lot of the, the COVID-19 applications that we, we've sort of found and that we're, we're lucky enough to be able to action, we see relevance going forward into broader immunoprofiling. So beyond yeah. COVID-19, but for be it the, the next infectious disease or be it a, a more broad-based, um, again, immunoprofiling touches virtually every major disease. So if we yeah. can use this opportunity to get proof points that don't necessarily put us in a position of saying, hey, we're going to replace the stuff that everybody's chasing after right now, like again, sure. the, the iron filings and, and the magnet. But this is what this sets us up to do. Just so again, back to the point, we're operating in the 100 day framework. Everybody needs to. Yeah. Uh, but we're not forgetting to zoom back out to think of, of the 1,000 or 2,000 day uh, outlook as well. That's very interesting, Andrew. Separately, we'll get back in touch because Abel, who's on the on the uh, call here as well, he and I were talking to an Austrian company about exactly what you just described. So we should put you and the Austrian company together at some point. Uh, right. But there we go. That's part of the networking uh, effect of these uh, these events as well. Uh, Simon, over to you, just to pick up on the thread from Frank and uh, and Andrew, but also you know. Uh, what is your thoughts on the very low take up of help and support from uh, government um, schemes? Okay, so about. let's talk about, talk about resilience first. Yes, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Thanks for Paul was saying. So obviously we talked a lot about cash and obviously without cash, you can't be resilient. Um, you know, as an accountant, I know cash is king. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> it's clearly absolutely key right now. But there are other aspects of resilience, one of which is leadership and Good leaders, uh, good leaders in peacetime don't necessarily make good leaders in wartime. And this is a wartime situation. So entrepreneurs who are good leaders have to learn how to become a different type of leader in this type of environment. And, and that means really, really good communication with your staff, with your customers, with your suppliers, with your advisors. You, you have to keep on repeating the message. You know, it's the old mantra of tell them what you're going to tell them tell them and then remind them what you've told them. And you have to keep doing that. Yeah. Um, and the best companies, the best companies I'm seeing at the moment have reacted very quickly to the situation. They've worked out how they're going to communicate each day with their staff, you know, nine o'clock call or whatever it is. Yeah. And there's a really clear modus operandi. So that's really important. And then I think planning and being strategic is really, really important. Never more important in this situation. And actually companies are, smart companies that I'm working with are saying, actually, how can we be strategic? How can we find a forum through which we can actually discuss strategy, discuss new ideas, pivot the business, think about the customer that's in trouble, think about the customer that's doing well and so on. So, that's, so anyway, there's a few ideas about resilience. In terms of the government schemes, I mean, the three big ones that we've really been discussing among Cambridge Angels, and we've been discussing quite a lot as Paul Anson and others know, is um, firstly the loan scheme. And the loan yeah. scheme, unfortunately, is not really relevant to many of our companies uh, <laughs> because none of, none of our companies would have been able to get a uh, loan from, from the banks in any case. Um, so they're not really relevant. Sec secondly, the, uh, the furloughing scheme, and as I said earlier, for some companies, a little bit of furloughing, it can be relevant. But a lot of our companies are trying to grow quickly and they maybe change their business model, but they still want, by and large, want all their people to be working for them. And then the third scheme was the 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 future fund which was announced yesterday which is mm -hmm. the, the match funding and the match funding scheme at the moment is relatively small compared with other european countries mm -hmm. um and it's and it's also probably more vc based than it is angel based it's not clear at the moment whether an angel investor could invest under eis uh in fact at the way it's designed at the moment is that's probably not the case at all but it it, it may still be a work in progress but but we'll we'll see in fact i think paul was sharing some information about earlier today so I think that's why the, the, you know, the take up hasn't been high because um, uh, it's not really appropriate for many of our companies. And for those companies that it is appropriate, uh, the risk, is, the risk is, is still too high for the, for the corporate. For the banks, you mean? No, for the, well, for the banks, probably, but, but for the corporate, yeah. why would the corporate want to load themselves up with more, with more, more debt? debt? Yeah, exactly. And then 
Yes, yeah, so it's not really working out too well. So can I just open this up to uh, questions to the to the panel, Frank, uh, to Anne, uh, Andrew, and to Simon, and actually to create a conversation because some great level of uh, content here from the names that I see. So I'm very, very happy to take some, some questions uh, at this point, if anyone has, would like to kickstart us looking at, uh, at this. Adam, are you about to say something? Adam Durant there? I can see her. I was just thinking about actually, hi, sir. Hi there. Uh, yeah, um, so yeah, Simon, I, I think you're absolutely spot on there because I've, I've been looking at the so-called support that's on offer and it's just wondering how it's um, really that relevant for companies that are either early stage or, or scaling, probably haven't got a lot of revenue. Um, and, and also there's, there's problems with, with the, the, the grant, uh, there's the minimus uh, restrictions on how much grant funding is available. So there are actually very little options available. And exactly as you've said, it's not very attractive to furlough employees. So at Satavia, we've got um, 12 full time on the books. I've, I've furloughed two people, which is kind of a painful process to go through. And then it's painful to have to have discussions around about reducing salaries, but we've done that pre preemptively, even though we've just raised cash, um, because I can already see we're selling into aviation. So not only are we faced with the same challenges as everybody else, our, our major market now is, is nose diving. Um, but we've, we've got some very talented data scientists. So we've actually started um, modeling COVID just from a data science perspective. And we're starting to get involved in a lot of initiatives in the industry. So we've been supporting UK uh, Ventilator Challenge. We actually modeled numbers of ventilators that would be required. We've got involved in a Rolls-Royce initiative called Emer 2 gent um, I'd like to do some press on that. Um, as a team, we're communicating better than we ever have. I've hired a project manager. I've got a head of strategy that used to run parts of the Air Force. So I really like what you said about um, it's a different kind of leader because actually uh, in, in sort of peacetime normal operations, um, you, you, you need a certainly, I, I think, a more people focused um, leader. And now you need somebody that's willing to sort of take the lead and make tough decisions. Um, so, yeah, it's a very difficult time. But also, I am looking forward to um, some of the opportunity that's going to come out of the back of this for those of us that managed to get through it. So, uh, we're doing everything we can to reduce OPEX. We've, we've knocked about 30% off our, 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 basically, our OPEX in the last month. Um, and I really don't know what's going to happen next, but we're doing every, everything we can to extend the runway. And uh, yeah, that's it, really. That's really good. Yeah. Sure. Very, great agility. Sam, are you about to respond to him? I see your... Yeah, just, just a very quick response. I mean, well done yes. for all of you. You've yeah. done already. Clearly, you're, you're using your skills thinking laterally and thinking about how you can apply your data scientist skills in other sectors. Um, it may be that for you, the, the help that's going to come on R&D tax credits and, in a, and from Innovate UK through grants, which we, we don't have the detail of yet. It was announced in principle yesterday, but we don't have any detail, uh, or at least I don't yet. Um, so maybe those things might be more helpful for, for a company like yourselves. Uh, 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 Arun, any, Arun, any insights you can give us on uh, Innovate uh, UK grants? Um. Yeah, at a high level, I think what they're trying to do is focus on all the innovative businesses. The first group that they're considering is companies that have already received some grant funding from Innovate UK in the past. And then the second group is those who may not have received funding, but are still doing innovative work. At the moment, um, all we have are the headline details. We expect more information to be shared later in the week. And for those companies who may have received Innovate UK funding that are on this call, um, look out for some additional details and the support could be in the form of grants as well as loans. Both forms, great, okay. Now, uh, since we've got a great panel, those of you that might have a specific question that affects you and your company or particular worry or, or uh, issue you don't think has been covered yet, now is a really good time to uh, to ask uh, Frank or Andrew or Simon uh, if they'd like to pitch in, or indeed uh, some of the others uh, in, the, in the audience. Something that hasn't yet been covered in some way. Uh, Robert, if Robert Fires. HR, yes. yes, of course, yes. please, Robert. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I was just going to ask, uh, is, you know, with something we haven't. With, looks as though we're fortunately not going to have to be in the position of doing this, but the people who have had to make significant salary cuts to the team, 
what impact have you seen that have on you know the team's motivation the the you know the team worker uh, yeah how how is it what impact has it had on the the company culture in acting something like that and how have you gone about doing it i assume we're talking about a blanket across everybody but perhaps not i'd be just interested to hear some some more detailed thoughts around that yeah, great question Robert. Simon, do you want to kick start? Because you, you mentioned a 50% cut for yeah. a particular yeah, no, company. How did I'm, that go? To have a go, Robert, it's a great question. Um, I, I think it requires uh, complete transparency. And usually, uh, when I've seen it succeed, uh, literally the whole team's got together and the CEO said, you know, this is why I think we ought to be doing and this is why. And, um, and they've essentially been able to get a buy-in from all of their team that that's what they should do. Um, and they've done it against the backdrop of the other options, which might be furloughing people, or it might be making some people redundant, uh, or it, it's setting the context well and agreeing, and, and then I think also agreeing that it is for a temporary period of time. Uh, so, so those are the things I would, uh, I would throw in. Also, bear in mind on furloughing that you can rotate people every three weeks on furloughing. And it seems to me that if you're, if you're going to share that load across an employee group, you might want to rotate people so that everybody feels that, you know, they're sharing the pain. So, Paul Anson might have some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, cool. Oh, Paul, you might have some thoughts. Uh, might I? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think, I think I absolutely echo what Simon was saying about transparency. That's, that's, that's a really good point. So it's almost worth repeating um, that in my experience, and not just in this circumstance, but in the past, I've been involved in businesses that are having difficulty. Uh, and I've seen it done well, and I've seen it done badly. Um, done badly, the CEO becomes, you know, just the most awful person in everyone's eyes, because and everyone's worried about what, you know, are they next? Is something bad going to happen? Blah, blah, blah. But done well, people are almost volunteering to, to help however they can. So transparency, communicating with staff, make sure they understand what's happening, what the risks are, what the opportunities are, um, you know, what it means for them really being transparent is, is just can't be overstated as being important in these circumstances. A, a good leader who earns trust from their staff will be able to pull a team through this with their support rather than fighting against them. And I, and I think that's one of the most important things for any leader in the situation to remember is that, you know, don't do it behind closed doors. Don't think I can't talk to people I can't tell them my worst fears because you just don't build trust that way and trust you know what's a team and what will pull through people through um so I just sort of emphasizing that point um I can't the question yeah. was there. <laughs> but I think yeah. you know I think you've got to be you've got to look at what's right for each company and, and I've and amongst my portfolio I've seen 80 percent furlough and I've seen zero percent furlough and both are right for that company and you just got to look hard at, at the selves and, and decide you know what's right for you whilst making sure that you're not just stagnating that you are looking at how are we best going to pull out of this and in fact so just to remind myself my 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 first business i co-founded uh, we we did a round of funding just before 9 11 and we we went from selling one unit a week a unit was two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to zero units for nine months um, it was a horrendous situation, but whether by luck or by judgment, we came out of that sort of recession, if that's the right word for what happened after 2011, I guess it is, um, with three new products. And when we launched, when we sort of came out and people were starting to buy again, our competition of the same products before 9-11, we had three new products. So we invested time and money into R&D and we came out stronger and we, we took over the market really. So you've got to think what can I do with this time to come out stronger um, as well as protecting your cash. Yeah. So that's a thousand day thing. Andrew, do you want to make a comment about uh, helping Robert uh, to answer his question? Well, the, the, I'll just echo <laughs> transparency. Um, so I'm thinking back to the, the Spanish Flemish company that took over orthomedics and I sort of had a ringside seat to see two very different styles of crisis management. Um, one was very charismatic on the surface, very, very, uh, very likable, shall we say, 
and the message was consistently, no, no, difficult times, but no, we're going to be all right. We can do it. We're going to be fine. Um, you know, we considered cuts, but we're not going to consider cuts. And then a month later, a bunch of people disappear and, oh, no, no, that was a one-off time. So I, I think um, that, that gradual deterioration of trust, really, to paraphrase what Paul said um, in the leader, was, was really damaging. Um, a, the CEO who took over from him, I describe as someone who would walk in the room, punch you in the face, and then say, it's going to get better from here on in. <laughs> um, I, I personally respond to the latter a whole lot better. I think a lot of people maybe don't initially, but when, um, so who, who was the gentleman earlier? I think it was Adam. Uh, you've done a good job of, of recognizing the situation, going in and, and cutting pretty hard pretty early. Um, that's that. Um, and hopefully it gets better from here. So more, more power to you. And I think that, that, you're displaying a lot of what I really liked about Eduardo's approach of let's be honest, let's explain why we're doing this really difficult thing. Let's not shy away from the fact that there's going to be pain for you. Um, but then we're in it together and you get hopefully that buy-in that, that leads to new products, that leads to new innovations, that leads to a, a better exit um, than, than, than the initial hit. Yeah, I think the uh, comment that Paul made about innovating out of it as well was really interesting. Uh, using the quiet time, as it were, to think through what happens, where you go next. And I've seen that in one or two companies elsewhere in this particular crisis. You also made the comments of having seen it several times before. Uh, and last week when we started the series, we were talking about kind of like a checklist. If you've never seen something of this kind before, you don't quite know. And I know every crisis is a bit different. But you've got the basis here of suddenly things collapsing around you. You kind of know, a little bit like a pilot in an airplane, what, what needs to be done next, you know, if something happens. And Andrew, you're about to respond to that? And I, I may, um, so 2008, I hadn't seen this before. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that um, instinct to get rid of all pride and go and say to people, I've never seen this before. What have you seen before? Help basically. Um, right. Jo Jonathan Milner did that for me. Um, he probably doesn't even remember doing this, to be perfectly honest, but he, he had a refreshing bluntness to him of saying, I, I, I don't know the world you're living in. I've never dealt with, with the private equity shareholders that you have, but here's what I'm seeing, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I appreciated that. I took a lot from those conversations. Um, and, and there can be, when you do this the first time, there can be uh, a desire to want to sound like, uh, I'm not disparaging Herman here, we all love Herman, but the arm story of where it was carefully planned out and everybody knew the plan going forward can be a bit intimidating to a first time chief exec. Uh, yeah. I think you have to have all the answers and actually the ones that get out of this go and get as much advice as they can, as they can yeah. find. And yeah. have, you know, have good advisors, Often they're good shareholders and investors, but not being afraid to say, I don't know what to do here. What have you seen? Can I use your experiences in your checklist? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, uh, I know, for Paul, uh, sorry, did you want to come in on that? I know that yeah, Simon I, has I, to go I, exactly I, at five, so. And you just triggered a thought. Oh. Um, yes. Shareholders, talk to your shareholders. Do not do anything behind. Uh, just as important as talking to staff. No one's I think ever mentioned this. You just triggered that. Um, because if you, if you don't need money today, but you might need something, you know, down the road earlier than you thought or for different reasons than you thought. If you're telling a story constantly to your shareholders and communicating with them again, it's about trust, buying in, making sure there's no surprises. Keep secrets and then go, we're going to run out of money next month. Help. And they didn't see it coming. Guess what? They've got other priorities. You're not their priority. Keep talking to shareholders. That's very good. So in the run-up to the last few minutes, Simon, did you want to, and then uh, Frank, uh, have any last words that you wanted to say and any thoughts that have been triggered through the conversation that uh, you feel would help? Uh, it's, well, just one other idea actually came mm. from what Paul was just saying there. Um, one of my companies, uh, they, they didn't feel that any of these schemes were going to be appropriate for them, but they, were, they did want to extend their cash runway. And so what, what they've actually done, they've been paid their R&D tax credit in February, so only just very recently. 
and they're already thinking in their head to next year's r and tax credit and they're thinking well actually couldn't we borrow against that and you can go you can go out there and get r and d firms to you know take five percent and pay you the money but they thought well why don't we offer that deal to our investors so so they're basically doing a deal with their existing investors to support them um and yeah that's a bit of that's a bit of out of the box thinking and kind of works for everybody yeah so, and okay. it gave them an opportunity to talk to to paul's point gave them an opportunity to talk to their shareholders and raise the profile yeah frank any any kind of uh thoughts that have been triggered that you'd like to uh yeah, we're running I, I really like your thoughts about like extending your runway this is the time to ask this is the time when people understand and even if you think you don't need it then go and have that conversation um and, and be open and transparent this, this is no time to go dark N not to anybody and not to the people you work with, not to your employees, not to VCs, not to the investors. Don't go dark. It uh, doesn't have dark. to be marketing, but let's be open and frank about what, what this is. And, um, and, and let's not paint this pretty picture of where we're at. Well, let's be very specific and clear. That this is hard. This is not easy. This is not for everybody. This is the time for action and to be very specific and clear on like what we're going to do next. Um, you can communicate and you can communicate in an open style so you still can yeah. receive feedback and, uh, and listen. Take the time to say, it's like, hey, this is my take on things. It, it, there's so many opinions out there. Let yourself be influenced by the so many others that are out there that can actually give you good intel about what others are doing. And you know what? Maybe you can learn something about these things. So extend your runway. It's like the, the, the salary cut uh, discussion. I really like the approach when leaders take a bigger cut than the rest. Um, it's like, hey, you get rewarded really well during the time when things go really well. Hey, let's let, let's be let's be the ones that actually set the right example. This is the yeah. time to take a bigger cut. Um, it's like, hey, and if the rest can participate, um, that, that is great. And yeah. ask them, uh, share the opportunity that they can help share, uh, save the company for the long term. And people want to pitch in. And it's like, hey, the, the, the amount of commitment you get from people, actually giving them the opportunity the to trust pitch in is, yes. is just amazing. It, uh, I think it can be a very powerful time but you can fuck things up very clearly now as well. <laughs> on, those, on that uh, no, note, uh, Frank, just uh, a quick, uh, I see that uh, Simon has, has, has posted a message. Thank you. Better times will come back, so plan your re-entry strategy. And just on that point as well, I think that uh, Len has also very kindly uh, put a post on the chat line that says the upcoming session, keeping and getting customers is coming up. So please do, uh, take a note, come back uh, to that because we're finding some interesting ways in which people are keeping and trying to gain customers. I've heard some great stories today about Black & Decker and Subasin's firm and so on. So it's, uh, I hope you're finding these conversations helpful and interesting uh, and stimulating. Uh, I'd like to thank Frank, Andrew and Simon very much for agreeing to be the, uh, the stimulators for this afternoon. I'd love you guys to come back again and uh, keep us going. We're planning uh, next week, and then we'll come back with another series of three uh, because Len, who's not visible uh, to you guys, uh, did a little survey with his companies and found there were, there he is, uh, found there were six thematic areas. So we'll do another three probably sometime in May, and hopefully he'll come back and uh, we'll share some more insights and just help each other through these dark days so we all come back stronger at the end. And meanwhile, therefore, thank you so much for participating this afternoon.